So we'll get things going, our first class of uh, 2018. Yeah. So welcome, everybody. Yeah. Lucy. No, she's okay. You sure? Oh. All right. So did you, did you have it last Tuesday? I did have it last uh-huh. Tuesday. Yep. Okay. Had it last I got Tuesday. To and, it. Uh, I haven't listened to it. I wasn't it. sure. I was ah. going to go on the internet and check. And then, I don't know what came up. So yep. okay. I guess that's it. It worked out great. I, you know, I'm here. I figure, you know, mm-hmm. I'll do it. So. How many were here last week? Or uh, we have maybe four people. It was pretty small. You were here. Three, I think. Three, three people. Oh, yeah, it was yeah. a small Leave group. Down in yeah, very. Yeah, right. Uh, very small group, but it was. Uh, it was nice. Good. Oh, yeah. It was nice. It's always. Uh, it's always the right number. So. <laughs> well. Let's uh, let's take a minute before we start with our meditation and uh, just invite everybody to set your intentions for this evening. Sometimes that's a way to look at uh, what we do. We we go through purification where we're letting go of any any negative thoughts in the mind or anything that might be a hindrance to meditation. And it can also be helpful to set an intention for the practice. And so sometimes I'll think about, may the results of my practice go to the benefit of all other beings. So not just myself, but if it helps me to be more peaceful, uh, more compassionate, more loving, then that will potentially benefit other people. So we can have a real noble intention as we practice. We do the work on ourselves, we feel better ourselves, but then we're also doing the work for those around us. So maybe just think about that for a moment as we begin. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. So we'll meditate together. So why don't you go ahead and take a minute or however much time you need to get comfortable sitting or laying down. And we'll, uh, we'll begin. Is the lighting okay? Is it too bright in here? Are we okay? Oh, right? do you want me to turn it off? No, if it's okay, then it's just fine. Turn it down. Yeah, let's see what it's like. Can you take it down? I'll turn it up later. I'll get better in the dark anyway. There we go. That should be good. I'll keep this on just so I can see. All right. So just a few (laughs) basic things to touch on as we get ready to meditate. You're trying to... Uh, Reach a degree of symmetry within your body so that you're supporting your weight equally on both sides That way no muscles or joints are taking on more weight than the other side be a little more comfortable for you as we go on Let your eyes close softly We do that just to eliminate the visual distractions the things that we see cause us to think So closing our eyes helps to limit that Let your breath be natural through your nose if possible. I know this is kind of cold and flu season, so breathe however you need to breathe to be comfortable. But if you can breathe through your nose, that'll be helpful. And then let the breath be natural. There's no need to manipulate it in any way. We just let the breath flow and come and go as it wants to. And so now I'll ring the bell and begin to guide us through the practice. Just let yourself follow the sound of the bell. Follow it as it fades into silence. And 
and let that silence be a very warm and welcoming invitation to turn your senses inward. One of the wonderful things about meditation practice, mindfulness practice, is that we start to learn that our own body is a very safe place to be. That there is stability, that there is safety, and that there is a reliability. So we can look to our own bodies and our own minds as a source of refuge and peacefulness. So as we turn our senses inward, we let go of our thoughts about the outside world. And it can be helpful just to focus on the feeling of being present in your own body. So there's just a feeling of being. The feeling of sitting here, the feeling of laying here. Just let yourself get in touch with that feeling of presence. It helps to anchor you, it helps to make you more stable. And then with that sense of presence established, let's all bring our awareness upward to the top of the head and to the area of the scalp. And we'll just spend a few moments observing physical sensations as they become known by awareness anywhere in the scalp. So we just bring awareness and pay attention, observing sensation. Sometimes there's temperature sensations, feeling of warmth or coolness. Sometimes there is the sensation of air movement. As the air moves in the room, you might feel it on the hair or the scalp. Sometimes there are sensations on the surface of the skin maybe a little tickle or an itch or a pulsation. So again, you're just opening up your awareness, remaining focused on the scalp, and observing any of these sensations as they arise. You might notice that they last for just a few seconds or a few moments, and then they pass away, or they transition into different sensations. So whatever comes up is what we're observing. There's nothing we need to find. There's nothing we shouldn't look at. We're just observing what is true in the present moment. And if you notice any tension in your scalp as you're observing, you can just let the tension go. Let that leave your body. Sometimes I share the image of the butterfly if you found a butterfly trapped in your home on a warm spring day, maybe on a windowsill in the porch or something, if you saw that butterfly, there'd be a great amount of compassion in your heart. You might walk up and cup the butterfly gently in your hands and carry it outside, releasing it into the trees or the grass might smile, there'd be a feeling of goodwill and kindness. And so as we encounter tension in our own bodies, we can react in very much the same way. Noticing, approaching with compassion, releasing it with goodwill, and unconditionally letting go. So now from the scalp, we can begin to move our awareness downward and really repeating the same process as we move down into the forehead. Let the awareness spread through the temples, and down through the eyebrows and into the eyes. So with awareness in these parts of the body now, we repeat the process of just bringing attention, pure awareness, just observing sensation, temperature, air movement, sensations on the surface of the skin. And maybe you notice your brow is furrowed, so you can release that tension. Or maybe you notice there's just a little tightness in the temples, you can let that go. If there is tension in the eyebrows or even the eyes, just bringing awareness to it is enough 
to allow you to release that tension. Let the tension go and continue to observe the sensations as they arise and pass away. And now from the temples we can move the awareness downward, feel it moving downward into the ears. Feel the sensations in the ears, observe, notice what's there. Allow the awareness to flow from <coughs> the ears forward. Feel it moving through the cheekbones and into the face. Just this soothing movement of awareness. And then from the eyes, you can feel as the awareness moves downward, passing through the nose and lips and mouth and chin. Again, just observing sensation. No judgment required. Nothing you shouldn't feel. Nothing you need to feel. You're just with your experience in this moment. Maybe you discover some tension in your jaws, which you can then release. Maybe you discover that your teeth are clenched a little bit and you can let that go. Or if you find your lips are pursed, you can release that tension. So we start to create in this attitude of mindfulness and acceptance. We find that we can bring greater and greater peace to the body as we move awareness through it. Just by letting go accepting what's there, releasing. And then from the chin, we can move awareness downward. Feel as the awareness moves down into your neck, your throat, through the sides of the neck and the back of the neck. Observing the sensations. And try to stay attentive to the sensations of the body. Sometimes it's easy to kind of float away and to daydream a little bit as you're becoming peaceful. But try to maintain that awareness of the sensations, noticing tension and letting it go. And then from the neck, you can guide the awareness downward into the shoulders. Feel the awareness spreading out through the shoulders, observing those sensations. And here in the shoulders, we might notice some new sensations, perhaps a feeling of contact between the shoulders and the chair or the floor. Or sometimes there's that feeling of contact between your skin and your clothing. So we're just observing whatever we notice in the shoulders. If they're shrugged, let them drop. Let all the tension go. And then from the shoulders, you can guide your awareness downward into your upper arms. And we'll give each part of the upper arms a little bit of attention, starting with the biceps. Observing the sensations. Letting go. Rotating awareness inward to the inside part of the upper arm. Feeling it from the underarms all the way down to the elbow joints. And then moving around to the backs of the arms, the triceps. Again, just observing, letting go, observing, letting go. Moving to the outside surface of the upper arms, observing and letting go. And then guiding the awareness downward further through the elbow joints. See if you can feel that flow of awareness as it moves through the forearms. Sometimes there's a very pleasant sensation to that flow of awareness. Sometimes there's a feeling of joyfulness that comes up rather spontaneously as you become peaceful and relaxed. Observe as the awareness flows downward through the forearms toward the wrists. And then it passes through the wrists into the hands. 
with awareness in the hands, observe the heels of the hands and the palms. And just remember everywhere this awareness goes, you're just noticing sensations and meeting any tension you discover with complete release. Just letting go. Moving to the tops of the hands, moving awareness through the thumbs and through the fingers now, observing and releasing. And then bring your awareness to rest in the fingernails for a few moments. Just focus on sensations in the fingernails, anything you notice. Sometimes there's a very subtle, very faint feeling of pulsation or of energy, so we observe. Sometimes there's tightness in the hands and fingers, so just release. And now from the fingertips, we'll bring our awareness upward to the top of the chest. Start by moving awareness across the collarbones and then just let it flow downward, passing through the chest, down further and further till it reaches the base of the sternum. And then from there, let the awareness flow outward through the rib cage. It starts to feel like a very natural process, moving the awareness, observing objectively, releasing tension. And then from the rib cage, we can bring awareness upward into the underarms. And from there, let the awareness flow down through the sides of the body. Moving all the way down to the waist. And then from the waist, bring the awareness forward into your belly. Observe the movement of the belly rising and falling with the breath. Sometimes there are sensations in the belly of expansion or contraction. Or sometimes the feeling of your clothing and your skin as they move together. Just observe the belly. Let the tension go. It's very common to hold tension in the belly, so we can just release that. Let the tension go, continue to observe. And now from the belly, we will move our awareness around to the back. And we'll start at the top of the back, the base of the neck. Let your awareness flow downward a bit through the shoulder blades. Observe as that awareness moves through the upper third of the back. And this awareness just illuminates sensation. Again, there might be feelings of contact if you're leaning against the chair or laying on the floor. Sometimes we'll even notice sensations that are a bit unpleasant. There may be pain or fatigue in the back, some sort of discomfort. And if we encounter these unpleasant sensations, Sometimes it's hard to accept them objectively. Sometimes it's hard to let the tension go because that lack of acceptance, the disliking or the aversion really goes hand in hand with the existence of the tension in the body. And so we can work with that very skillfully and effectively by becoming aware of the expansiveness of our awareness. Our awareness is so great, so vast, so expansive. There is room for everything to be just the way it is. And it can be okay. So just observe difficult sensations just as you would a neutral sensation or even a pleasant one. Allow it to exist in this expansive awareness without pushing it away, without thinking negative thoughts. 
you find this helps you to release the tension, to become more accepting of the sensations of the body just as they are. Let the awareness flow from the upper third of the back down through the middle part. You can let it move a little further down through the lower part of the back now. Everywhere you bring this awareness, there is a compassionate knowing of sensation. There's an awareness of tension and a compassionate, unconditional release. We begin to feel more and more peaceful, more naturally joyful as the awareness moves through the body. Feel now as the awareness moves down through the sit bones. Feel it moving through your hips. Feel it moving through the pelvis. Illuminating all of the sensations with awareness. And then letting the tension go. And then we can move the awareness downward a bit further into the thighs. Begin to allow that awareness to move all the way from the tops of the thighs down to the knees. And we can focus for a moment on the upper surface or the top surface of the thighs, the part that's facing upward. Noticing the sensations and letting go. And then rotating to the outer surface of the thighs. Same process, observe, release. Moving to the underside of the thighs now, observing and letting go. And moving to the inside part of the thighs. We observe sensations, we know them with awareness. We let go of the tension. Feel the awareness flowing down through the knees now. Again, that process, know and let go. Allow the awareness to flow downward from the knees into the calves. Feel it moving through the shins. Feel it moving further down toward the ankles and observe as awareness passes down into the feet. And with awareness in the feet, observe your heels, and observe your soles, the balls of the feet, moving around to the top surface of the feet now, observing, just accepting every aspect of the experience just as it is letting tension leave the body, moving awareness down into the toes and finally the toenails, focusing on the toenails, see if you can detect some subtle sensations, just observe, just observe. Now from the toes, we will bring our awareness once again up to the top of the head. Just bring it back to the scalp. And this time at your own pace, you can start to observe sensations and release tension and move your awareness down through your face, through the head, and downward through the body. As I say, just move at your own pace. Sometimes it's helpful to use the breath as a tool. You can breathe in, and as you breathe in, you can observe a specific area. As you breathe out, you can release the tension in that area. And then you can move to the next spot and breathe in, observing sensation. Breathe out, releasing tension. Moving down through the body like this. Pay attention to those areas where muscle tension has returned. There are often a few spots where you just let the tension go a few minutes ago and now it seems to have returned just on its own. 
And what we experience here is that the habit energy of the body and the mind work together to hold tension in different parts of the body. And we do this as a defense mechanism, as a way of protecting ourselves from danger or from difficult emotions, from things that make us angry. All of that manifests as tension in the body. So by becoming aware of these places where tension shows up habitually, we can just let it go over and over. Begin to change that habit of the body and mind into one of peacefulness, of letting go, of complete release. So once you've had a chance to move your awareness down through your body, you can bring it up to the base of the nose. And to begin with, just focus on the little patch of skin beneath your nostrils and above your upper lip. Focus awareness there. Become aware of the movement of the breath in and out. Expand that awareness just a bit further into the rings of the nostrils. And then you can expand just a little further into the nasal passages. So you have awareness in this triangular area of the nose. Just observe. Just be with the movement of the breath. Very simple. Breathing in. You know that you're breathing in. Breathing out, you know that you're breathing out. Breathing in a long breath, you notice that it's a long breath. Breathing out a short breath, you notice that it's a short breath. We stay with the breath for its full duration. Staying with the in-breath as it starts and slows and pauses and it becomes the out-breath. And then we stay with the out-breath, observing, watching as it slows, pauses, and then becomes the next in-breath. So just stay with the cycle of the breath, breathing in, breathing out, being aware, the in-breath, and the out-breath. And as you're observing the movement of the breath, open up awareness to the touch of the breath anywhere in this triangular area of the nose. There is a feeling as the air passes through of touch. Just observe and let your awareness expand a little bit into that feeling of touch. Breathing in, maybe the air feels a little drier and then breathing out, maybe it feels a little more moist. Breathing in, sometimes the air will feel cooler. And breathing out, sometimes the air will feel a bit warmer. So we just observe the movement of the breath, the touch, and the sensations of the breath. And as we stay focused on this small part of the nose, sometimes things will come up to distract our awareness away. We might suddenly be drawn to a sound, cars going by or a sound in the room. And in the moment that that happens, if you become aware of a distraction, all you need to do is bring your awareness back to the nose. You can let go of the sounds. Just focus once again on the movement of the breath, the touch and sensations of the breath anywhere in that triangular part of the nose. Sometimes distractions come in the form of strong bodily sensations. You might feel a little bit of fatigue or sometimes feels like a part of the body is falling asleep. If you notice these sensations and they distract you, again, in that moment, just guide the awareness back to the breath. 
Every moment is a chance for renewal. Let go of distractions, remain focused on the breath. Sometimes the mind will be the source of distraction. You'll notice you're thinking about something or remembering or planning. And so if this happens in that moment of awareness, just guide the awareness back to the nose, back to the triangular area of the nose. Stay focused on the breath. And just do that over and over as often as you need to. It's never a problem to be distracted. It is an opportunity to refocus awareness and strengthen concentration. Now let's just share a few minutes together in silence, observing the breath, returning as often as we need to from distractions, Let's share a few minutes together and then I'll sound the bell to end the meditation.
to the room. Continue to hold your self in that spirit of compassion. It's one of the wonderful things about this practice is that everything we do, we're observing the experiences of the body and the mind with compassion. So if anybody needs to stretch or stand, there's tea in the kitchen. Help yourself if you want some tea. Or some water. We'll just take about a two minute break and then we'll start with the talk. So feel free. But uh, yeah, keep in mind that just holding the body, holding yourself in compassion. And we really start to feel that after we spend a few minutes with it in meditation. Just letting everything be as it is. And letting that be okay. Yeah, I still, uh, I still look at that every day, and it's amazing how beautiful it is. Cheryl really did a wonderful job. And Lucy did a good job of meditation tonight. She did really good today. Yeah, she stayed she right. Barked once. Yep. She stayed right there. She just kind of shared my cushion. She didn't really need hers. Yeah. Yeah. She had her toenails clipped today. Oh. Yeah. So they get a tranquilizer to do that? No. She lets me. Uh, she lets me do it. Oh, you do it. Yeah. Sometimes she gets a little not so much liking it, but uh, she does pretty well. So yeah, she let me clip them. So well, you like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Some, some are really hard. Yeah, some people really do. They have to take their dog to the vet to get them uh, clipped. So, yeah. So she's a very pretty manager. Teddy. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's see. I suppose we can get this handed out. And uh, maybe recruit Don. Thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> that is a cute one. Did you just take that? Yes. Well, maybe maybe you can send that I'll to me. I'll send it. Yep, I'll post it on the on the Facebook page. Yeah, feel free to turn yeah. any of the lights on, adjust them however you'd like. Thank you. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, uh, tonight I wanted to talk about the four Brahma Viharas and go into a little more detail about them. Um, I like to touch on these, pay some real good attention to them, usually a couple times a year, and right around this time of year always seems to be kind of a, a natural time for that as we're looking at our New Year's resolutions, ways we want to 
maybe feel better in the year ahead. And so uh, one tool that we have available to us is this practice of the four Brahma Viharas. So each week we do this together. I think most of you know by, by the name, the four Brahma Viharas, what that is. But at the end of our meditation, um, at the end of our talk each week, We'll go through the, may all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings be surrounded by love and kindness. May all beings be joyful and happy. And may all beings be equanimous and free and peaceful. So that is a recitation of the four Brahma Viharas. But I wanted to talk about these in some detail to really unlock uh, the value and the power that they have for everyday life. Um, and part of the reason that I'm so uh, enthusiastic about it is that it just made a tremendous difference in my own life, in my own experience. And I continue to work with it as a practice on a daily uh, and a weekly basis. Um, and it continues to kind of amaze me what transformation this makes. So uh, I've had, you know, in my past, I think, just about everybody has, who've gone through traumatic experiences as a kid or as a young adult, you know, things happen, there's um, maybe relationships that don't end well, or there's different traumatic experiences that happen. And I think for most of us, uh, part of the response, part of the way that we deal with that is to kind of close ourselves off a little bit. It's like if we feel like we've been hurt uh, too many times we start to maybe close off our um, our sensitivity a little bit so that we're we're less susceptible to being hurt by other people, less susceptible to being taken advantage of or victimized. And I think in one way or another, just about everybody has this happen to them over the course of their lives, whether you're younger or you know wh whatever whatever time in your life we have these different experiences. And it can be, um, you know, just lots of simple, small things. It could be some very traumatic, uh, specific things. So, um, recognizing in myself, as I got into the practice, that I still carried an amount of grief and anger. And that I did close myself off emotionally uh, from many of those around me. So, metaphorically, it was like I built a high wall around myself for protection. And I came to realize uh, as I got into the meditation practice that while the wall kept out some of the threats, that it also kept out the love and the personal connection that's so essential for a really happy, vibrant life. Uh, and so um, as I progressed into the adult world, the business world, I held on to that uh, sort of closing off. I felt that being hard-hearted was kind of an asset in the business world, um, that it made me a better negotiator, kind of a tougher manager, was able to, uh, you know, save more money or make better deals or, you know, these kinds of things. So this was very much something that I carried with me throughout my life, through, through my younger years, childhood, uh, through my years as a young adult, and then um, as I progressed into middle age. So what I discovered as I began practicing meditation and learning the Dhamma, and the Dhamma, that just means the, the volume of teachings that we work with that, that help us to understand mindfulness practice. So as I began meditating and learning the Dhamma, uh, the one thing that I realized is that we really can't block or withhold kindness from one person and at the same time, give it fully to someone else. You know, we're not that good at compartmentalizing as human beings. We try to do it. You know, it's like you can close your heart off to maybe one person or a group of people and then try to be very compassionate and loving to your children, which we do with some degree of success. But what we discover is that there's always this, there's a conflict there that somehow there's this, uh, what, what we might call cognitive dissonance, that if we want to be a truly loving, uh, open, authentic being, that the part of ourselves that we close off to others, even though it's in self-defense, 
but that gets in the way of really accomplishing that goal. So we might love our partner or our kids or friends or family, whoever it is, uh, but then there's still that part of us that's closed off. So I uh, just wanted to share a little quote. Uh, this is from Jack Cornfield's book, A Path with Heart, a uh, wonderful book. He says, the compartments we create to shield us from what we fear, ignore, and exclude exact their toll later in life. Periods of holiness and spiritual fervor can later alternate with opposite extremes, binging on food, sex, and other things, becoming a kind of spiritual bulimia. Spiritual practice will not save us from suffering and confusion it only allows us to understand that avoidance of pain does not help. So for me to contemplate that was, it was kind of to start to crack the foundation of that wall. That I realized that, yeah, these defense mechanisms, these boundaries that I put up throughout my life, um, that maybe those were the very things that were preventing me from really feeling like I uh, had intimate relationships with other people around me or really feeling like there was a relationship of trust with those around me. And I share all this, you know, this personal stuff, but I share it because I think everybody else has this too, in one way, shape, or form. Everyone's life takes a different path, the experiences are different, but we all kind of go through this thing where we're trying to protect ourselves, but at the same time, we're trying to love others. So, um, Conversely, we can't generate feelings of hatred or ill will for one person while completely insulating someone else from that toxic emotion. Trying to operate within that paradox causes us a lot of stress and confusion. So that's, again, another challenge, trying to, trying to work that trick of I really dislike or I really hate or I really have ill will towards this person but you, I love, um, again, there's just a conflict there, natural conflict. So this is something that uh, many of us become aware of as we're practicing. When I first started to get involved in meditation, one of the things that I learned was that we were supposed to do this meta loving kindness practice or the four Brahma Viharas. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm not so sure that I want to do that. I want to meditate so I can get peaceful. I want to meditate so I have a degree of serenity and I kind of de-stress. But I'm not sure that I want to take on this compassion, loving kindness, appreciative joy and equanimity part of it. I was kind of a little bit resistant to that. And so I kind of kept it at arm's length and I worked on the other parts of the practice and I had, I had good results. You know, I, I did feel calmer, I did feel more quiet. I felt more focused. Um, there were a lot of benefits that come from meditation. But there was always kind of that thing in the background that was that thing that I just kept kind of putting on the back burner. Yeah, you know, I'll get to the compassion part later. I'll get to the loving kindness part later. I'll just work for now on, on this focus and this, this meditation uh, part of the practice. So that was, that was really my experience for quite a few years. But one of the things that I learned um, through my own experience and through just really being brutally honest with myself, I guess that's another thing too, is that, um, you know, I think I was pretty good at telling myself one thing, but maybe it wasn't the truth. And so um, really starting to look at things, being brutally honest in meditation, and that's where many of us learn how to do it. If you're sitting and meditating, whatever comes up is what comes up. You know, you, you really, you can't deny it or you can't push it away. Um, these experiences that you're having are real. And so to deny them is to really, uh, it's what we call delusion in the practice. Um, so when we really start to pay attention to what's going on and not deny it any longer, we come up with really the understanding that hate is non-directional and love is non-directional. So um, 
you know, hate. We, we might think, I can hate this particular person, and that might be the, the person you think about when you're generating or cultivating those feelings is hate, but really you're sort of stewing in them, right? I mean, you're feeling it. You might say, I hate this person for what they did to me, but really the experience of hate is happening here. You know, they are the object, you're the subject. So they're the object of hatred, but you're the one that feels the hatred. You're the subject. And the same thing is true with love. When you love someone, there's that feeling of, you know, I, I love this person. I'm directing my love at this, you know, my partner or my close friend or my child or whatever it is. I feel love for that person. But again, that person is the object you are the subject. You're the one that's experiencing the love deep down inside. You're the one that has the experience. Um, hatred is non-directional. Love is non-directional. So armed with that, it's kind of a, 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 a good way to approach what are these four Brahma Viharas? Why are they important? Why, why do they uh, why do they rank up there to a degree where we recite them very briefly, at least at the end of each week's uh, meditation practice? Um, and so I want to get into that a little bit. But I guess my question is, does the stuff so far, does this kind of make sense? Just kind of spilling it out here and, yeah. You know, kind of no, I think maybe the, the, the thing you can kind of see that the law gets a little harder to the, the object and the... Yeah, and it takes... Um, yeah, that's why uh, the name for what we do is practice, mm -hmm. you know, and so that seems so appropriate over and over again is that, yeah, we, we kind of need to work with this. And so some of this stuff, it's like intuitively we know it. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I hear that and I get it, and I think that's pretty right. And then there's other stuff that it's like, well, you know, I'm not so sure. Let me see about that. Um, there was a... Uh, uh, a line by uh, an author, Sherry Huber, who was, uh, re she recounted a friend who was in a uh, Buddhist monastery with her. They were both nuns together. And they were in this monastery for quite a period of time, and there would be these periods where they would have um, more of a senior person in the order go to them and give them maybe some um, advice on their practice, maybe talk to them about, you know, what what they were doing right, what they were doing wrong, what they might need to work on. And some people would get very defensive about it and they would kind of close themselves off. Um, and, uh, but she recounted one of her friends who, was, uh, who would receive that information and she, said, she would say, let me take that and sit with it and I'll see what of that is true for me. You know, so she, it was kind of a really nice way of saying it. It was like, I hear you, I hear what you're telling me, I understand the context in which you're telling me, which is like, you know, we're trying to uh, improve things, trying to improve our practice, our, our interactions with each other, our relationships. And, but she would recognize that there is sometimes that natural resistance. So she would just say, yeah, you know, thank you for that. Let me go sit with it, and I'll see what of that is true for me. And so she would go do that. And so I think that's really kind of uh, where we start to go with these four Brahma Viharas, is we can talk about these and we can see, you know, what of this is true for us, and then we can work with it appropriately. But the neat thing is, I think as soon as we open ourselves up to it, that we're fully equipped to deal with it the right way. It's like we just respond appropriately. You know, if we're willing to be completely honest and open with ourselves. So, um, but yeah, just focusing on that hate is non-directional. Love is non-directional. You can create it, cultivate it, think you're aiming it, think you're sending it, but, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like detonating a radioactive explosive where you're standing. I mean, you know, yeah, it's spreading out, but you're still at the center of it. So, the four Brahma Viharas. Um, it's a combination of two Pali words, this Brahma Vihara, 
Uh, Brahma meaning divine or highest, kind of highest level, or sometimes heavenly. And then the word Vihara means abode or dwelling. So Brahma Vihara together is usually translated as divine abodes. Sometimes it's called immeasurable mind states, or I a lot of times just refer to them as the highest states of human consciousness. So again, what we're dealing with is compassion, loving kindness, appreciative joy or joy, and then equanimity, which is this peacefulness, this balance, this freedom of mind and spirit that we can cultivate. Um, so that's what the four Brahma Viharas are referring to. So it's, uh, you know, it's not a, uh, it's not like a magical thing or some superstition. It's really, you know, where we are every day with what we live with. Um, so the other thing about these four Brahma Viharas is that we can look at them as types of energy that we can both sense and cultivate. Because we can feel these. We walk into a room, you can feel when there's this negative energy in a room, or if there's positive energy, or if there's love, or if there's an uptightness to it. You, know, you can feel that. We're all sensitive beings, and so we kind of we kind of develop our sensitivity towards this. But we also become aware that we can intentionally and volitionally cultivate them. So that tonight, when we started, I said, you know, sometimes it's helpful to think about your intention if you're coming to meditate. You know, what is it? What is your intention on coming? Um, there's no wrong answer to that. Uh, the answer, whatever your answer is, is the right answer. Sometimes it's just like, well, I just like sitting in that space and sharing that meditation time with other people. Or sometimes it's like I'm really focused on trying to uh, clear my mind of negative or harmful thoughts. Or you know, it could be could be anything. But our intention is really what's behind this. And so that makes us wonderful, is that we can, just by, through our own volition and intention, we can cultivate these four Brahma Baharas. And as we do, uh, we get more and more benefit from them. So as we dig into them, um, I want to talk about some different aspects of them, which I think are helpful, um, which are the near enemy and the far enemy of the four Brahma Baharas. So, uh, according to the tradition, each one of these has a complete opposite state. So for most people, if you said, well, what's the opposite of love? You'd say hate, right? Um, what's the opposite of joy? Well, it would be maybe grief or sadness, you know, something like that. So we, we instinctively get that there's kind of an opposite side to these. So uh, according to the teaching, um, the Pali word for compassion is karuna. Um, I think that's helpful just because some teachers use that when they talk about compassion or the four Brahma Viharas. I know Thich Nhat Hanh uses the Pali words when he talks, and I know that many people uh, read his books and love his uh, audios and so forth. So the uh, karuna is compassion. Uh, and the far enemy of compassion is really a feeling of contempt or ill will. So that's the opposite of compassion. And you might have other ideas too, which you know, I'd welcome hearing if anybody's got any, you know, as, as you're hearing this, if, if something clicks, um, feel free to share it with the group. But yeah, so the opposite of compassion is just sort of that feeling of contempt or ill will for someone else. Um, and then there's what's called the near enemy, which is, it's not the opposite, but it's something that sort of can masquerade as the actual Brahma Vihara. So in this case, you, uh, the near enemy of compassion is pity, right? Because if you pity someone, there's sort of a, there's like a, a, a hint of disdain for the person. There's sort of a hint of almost... You know, I pity you, I, but there's like a little bit of, and I place the blame on you, you know, for your, for the things that are going wrong. Um, so it's helpful to be aware of those because in many cases, that's kind of the natural place we go. 
is to that near enemy. And sometimes we get hung up there because we think that's it, you know. I'm not feeling contempt or real will anymore, but I look at these people and I feel pity. Well, that's not quite where you want to be. And pity, though, is kind of like almost looking down on someone. Yeah, right. You know, it's condescending. And it is. Yeah, it's, it's condescending. And, you know, I want to be careful here, too, because we all define things a little differently here. But we're looking at, yeah, if you really look at compassion. To me, compassion is... Um, when we look at the uh, difficult experiences that other people are having and we see that with the same eyes that we see our own difficulties you know if the thing was happening to me I know how I feel and so when I look at this other person experiencing the same thing I see their suffering as just as valid and real and important as my suffering is to me you know so that's kind of the way I define compassion or one of the ways that I define compassion but uh, you're right Joni I think pity or uh, yeah this near enemy there is sort of a feeling a little bit of contempt a little bit of well you know that's kind of your kind of your problem you know or here's here's an honest you know here's an honest thing you can see uh, a news story that someone's house burns down and if it seems like it's a small house and a and a family that's doesn't make much money, you know, it's you, you can feel compassion. Or you can see ten million dollar mansion burns to the ground, you know, everything got lost in that fire too, and nobody was killed, but you know, you can see that. And then it's then it's kind of, you start to see where the mind goes with that, right? It's a little easier to withhold that true compassion. It's kind of like, well, you can afford it. No big deal, you know? It's just, it's, that's too bad. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, right. They got it, so it doesn't really make a point. Yeah, it, exactly. And while there might be a grain of truth that this person has more resources that they'll be able to come back from this thing, of course, the experience of losing everything you've got in a fire is pretty dramatic. Right. So, but it's just interesting to notice the way the mind starts to work with these things as we encounter them. So for me, you know, uh, things like reading news stories are always kind of a living laboratory of, you know, how am I, how am I responding to that? What would ill will be then? Ill will. Ill will? Be. <laughs> um, well, sometimes it would just be a real cold-hearted... Uh, they deserve um, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind, of like, kind of like Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they deserve it. I have no Hurricane. sympathy what's, whatsoever. They had it coming, you know. They made so many bad choices, this is their problem. You know, they're just going to have to deal with it. So, you know, some of it, there's a fine line, uh, and it depends on the individual, but it's becoming aware of the fact that there's kind of this spectrum. And so on the one end is this contempt or ill will. On the other end is this real genuine love and compassion that we might have, or we're we just saying compassion right now. And that somewhere in the middle we might start to land and think we're, you know, and think we're there. So really what I'm suggesting is that if we become aware of those near enemies, those are kind of the places where we get hung up because we think we're there, but we're not quite there. Mm -hmm. If we become aware of these, then we really can transform our lives. We really can set ourselves free when we get to that point. I, I see pity sometimes as not trusting that person to handle it. Mm -hmm. I could um, see that. You're not giving them credit um, to be able to get through it. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that for sure. Feeling sorry for them, in a sense? Could you be like feeling sorry for them a little bit or not? A little bit, but sometimes that, that, uh, that blame or that condescension, mm -hmm. it's like I feel bad for you, but, <laughs> you know, you keep making dumb decisions this kind of thing. So again, that, that seems to be a real natural place that we go. So in, that's a natural place that, that I will go. So, you know, that's why I share. I kind of put myself out there as the, as the example and, um, you know, of, of how to do it wrong <laughs> in many cases. But, you know, so that's where we end up. But by becoming aware, hey, maybe I'm in the pity stage of this thing. Is it possible for me to cultivate real, true, pure compassion? 
And when you're able to do that, um, it really is liberating. It really starts to set you free. I went to a talk a couple months ago on um, racism over at uh, in St. Paul. And this woman that was speaking about it was talking about how we see things through only our eyes, which we've talked about a lot. Yeah. You know, we look at things from our own perspective, and it's really hard for us because most of us are uh, have are live with a certain sense of white privilege, mm -hmm. and we can't put ourselves in the position of a person of color. We can't really understand what their life is like and how they daily are subjected to probably some racist feelings or whatever. Yeah, and I think that kind of goes along with that, you know. It's hard to put yourself in somebody else's shoes or position mm -hmm. because yeah. we all look at things through our own... Uh, we, we look at things through the lens of our own conditioning. Right. Yeah, you know, it's just, and, and so that's, mm -hmm. that's not to, you know, say somehow that then we're mean-spirited or that we're not right. willing to be more compassionate, but, you know, a lot of times it can be like, boy, it never even occurred to me, you know, never even occurred to me. Um, for me, as I started to get involved in this four Brahma Viharas and kind of realizing, uh, what was at play here, I was very much immersed in the business world at that time. And so this was, this was a big shift for me because I really felt like, you know, if I, um, if I could stay tough, you know, then I'll be seen as a good negotiator that will make me more valuable to the company, you know, this kind of thing. There's sort of this, you know, almost cultivating the closing off. Um, but then, you know, you sort of take that with you and you see the news story and then there is this maybe feeling of contempt or this feeling of blame. Um, and so what you end up with is that you're really not setting yourself free. You're not setting your own heart free. So, that, you know, that's kind of where this gets at is it just comes to your own freedom, your own real ultimate happiness. Um, Someone said it's how we see things. Right. What, what we see, how we see them. Right, yeah. Or, or sometimes I'll share uh, the little saying, it's not what's happening that's important, it's your relationship to what's happening that's important. You know, so it, just about anything could be happening, but the way you're relating to that, the way you're responding to that, makes all the difference in the world. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of relativity there, a lot of relativity there. Another little quote from, from Sherry Huber. I've mentioned her a couple times and, um, she is just a joyful spirit. Uh, she's got stuff that's online. She writes her books in this script, uh, because the first book she ever wrote, she wrote it by hand with a pen and paper, and then she made copies of it and, and published it. So she still does that in the tradition, but she's, uh, uh, she runs a Zen monastery in California, and she's just a rock-solid teacher. So this is just a little bit outside of what we're talking about here, but I wanted to share it because I think this is great. She says, this is your best opportunity. There will never be a better opportunity than this one. No better time, no better place, no better circumstance. Right here, right now, right this minute. If it's really a hard time for you, you're closest to the truth. When you are drowning, that is your best opportunity to learn to swim. Why? Because there's nothing else on your mind. Nothing you need to get done first. It is your first priority. And we always do what is truly our first priority. Don't be confused by what you say is most important to you. Watch what you do. What you do is what is most important to you. Obviously, if your life were completely happy, you wouldn't still be looking for answers. And yet our fear of doing something differently, of facing the unknown, of going against society's norms, of questioning our conditioning, is so great that we continue to follow the same patterns over and over, even when we know full well that they lead to unhappiness. We continue to choose our beliefs over our experience. 
so this little passage here really spoke to my coming to this realization that yeah you know if if this is a priority then it's a priority and if not you know if not now when if not now when and so for me uh, the choice was well I guess I need to finally face this and do it and so then you know uh, real progress real transformation I began to see that when I had really difficult things happen in my life that I felt grief and sadness and anger and things like that still but what I also felt like is I have now access to a new way of being compassionate to other people that I didn't have access to before you know so kind of touching on what you were saying Elaine and what you were saying we don't um, and what you were saying Linda you know our experiences um, if we don't have an experience of something it's hard to be truly compassionate so that's one thing you can always look at is anytime something really difficult happens in your life you have got now a way that you can go make a difference in somebody else's life that you really didn't have access to before so this compassion and and the the, the scary thing it's kind of like maybe analogous to jumping out of an airplane with a parachute that's scary right I've never done it but it's just yeah I can imagine that that's pretty scary and so sometimes sort of making the first move and saying okay I'm gonna act with compassion I'm gonna act with loving kindness that can be a little scary it's like I'm jump I gotta you know this is a leap of faith here I gotta do it what I found though is that in my own experience and really the experience of everybody else that I've ever talked to who has done it is this has been a great transformation and that there's just a feeling of absolute freedom a feeling of transcendence when they go through this process doesn't mean you don't still end up maybe once in a while getting the short end of the stick or somebody might you know take advantage of you a little bit we try to prevent that try and do what we can to protect ourselves we don't want to be doormats and just have bad things happen but it is kind of it's you know it goes with the price of admission that from time to time people might do things that you know aren't really in our best interest but we continue to do our best with compassion loving kindness and appreciative joy and finally equanimity so but can loving kindness doesn't mean that you just do what everybody else does. I mean like you can't say no you can say no oh absolutely just be nice about it I mean mm -hmm. that you don't have to right yeah don't don't and confuse sometimes you can't do things that right and, and people might try to make you feel guilty or something but mm -hmm. it's like yeah absolutely I, I like that idea when someone gave her a suggestion she said oh I'll I'll think about it think about it yeah rather well, than saying oh, that won't work mm -hmm. yeah no, that's not for me yeah you know? let me sit with so that loving and, kindness is accepting it yeah let me sit with that and see what's true for me in that you know and that that to me it was so neat because it's like it's a way of validating what the other person is saying it's being respectful but then it's also saying you know and I'm really gonna take a look you know I really will sit down with this and see what's there um, and that's uh, that's a really helpful thing to do you know sometimes we don't want to look at maybe you know the junk that we have but it's it's helpful to do it and then you see yeah you know, there is something there and I might be able to do something with that um, and you're right loving kindness you know a lot of times I use the the term doormat none of this means okay do whatever you want clean out my bank account you know just all this kind of stuff no you're, you're not you're not gonna be a doormat you're not gonna be uh, taken advantage of you know consider if um, if you've been a parent of a small child you know the small child wants to go grab the boiling pot of food on the stove because it's hungry and it thinks that stove is a neat thing and so it wants to go grab that and and pull that down well with the wisdom we have as adults we know that child's gonna get horribly burned and so we might scream you know stop or you know something like that and it might frighten the child make the child cry but this is done out of loving kindness and compassion because we want to prevent that that child from getting hurt you know so yeah there's a real strength to this and I think that's one of the other things that I learned in my own personal path is that 
um, that there is strength in this. That that we're not we're not getting weaker. That we're getting stronger. Uh, we're looking through the eyes of compassion, loving kindness, appreciative joy, and equanimity. And so we're relating to the world in a different way. But we're also, you know, we can be fiercely uh, in support of, you know, rights for others. We can be, um, you know, we can be fiercely anti-violence or anti-war. You know, so none of this is saying you just have to kind of become passive and just forget everything and, and just, you know, let stuff happen. But in fact, what this does is it actually gives us access to more courage uh, because we're not, we're no longer conditioned by the far enemy or the near enemy. We're seeing things through the eyes of wisdom. And uh, so that makes a big difference. So um, compassion being the first one, then uh, loving kindness, obviously, you know, the opposite of that is pretty easy to understand. Hatred or anger is the opposite of loving kindness. But then somewhere in there, that near enemy can be like a selfishness or a neediness. And some of us who have had uh, like uh, boyfriend, girlfriend type relationships, something like that, um, there can be that time where, you know, you might feel a lot of a lot of love and affection for this person. But then there gets to be that neediness. You know, it's like, well, I, you know, I feel like I need more attention and I feel like you shouldn't go do things with your other friends. You know, I need all that time to be for me. And sort of under, under the guise of, and by the way, I love you, but we're, we're coming at it from this near enemy, which is sort of a selfishness and a neediness. And so we're, you know, we're not allowing that love relationship to grow in the way that it might. So it's just to be aware of that. Again, all this stuff is just sort of food for thought. Take it and sit with it. See what of that is true for you, and then work with that part. Um, appreciative joy. This is, and I'll just give you a little explanation of appreciative joy, because it's not quite as obvious as some of the others. Um, we tend to have what I call a circle of joy. So if something good happens to me, um, you know, let's say I win a thousand dollar, uh, in a, bingo. yeah, in a bingo. <laughs> you know, let's say I win that. Well, I'm pretty happy if I win that, you know, my circle of, of joy includes me. So I'm pretty happy if I win that money. Well, let's say if I go there with my mom and she wins that money, I'm pretty happy that my mom won that money. You know, that's my circle of joy, right? Or my child, you know, what if I go with a pretty good friend and they win the money? You know, then it's a little different, right? I mean, that circle of joy, not for all of us, but, you know, it, it, as you start to get out further and further, that circle of joy, uh, you know, it starts to, it changes as you get further out. And so part of this practice is to begin to look at things, simple things, that you can, you can just sort of capture as a source of joy that really have, they're outside of your normal circle of joy. So I'll, I've shared stories of, I see a couple who seems like they go for a walk out here just about every day and I see them. And they walk together and it seems like no matter what the weather is and you know, so they're exercising. And so it's like, well that's neat. I don't know them, I don't know anything about them, but it just seems to me kind of special that this couple goes out and walks together like this. Or, you know, I can see a couple of people, uh, if I'm in the supermarket, I see some couple and they're holding hands. Or I see somebody, you know, give somebody a little hug or something like that. Well, that's outside of my circle, but I saw that. And so, you know, I take that stuff on as my joy. So appreciative joy, it's something we cultivate, but it's something, you know, we kind of need to work with that a little bit. So it's looking beyond our immediate circle of what we might call joy and the participants in it looking at other people and really getting a feeling of joy from that. And as I say, I think you're there when somebody in another state can win the lottery for $250 million and you're just as excited for them as you would be for yourself. I don't know that anybody would ever get to that level, but to me that would be, you, you've, you've arrived, you've arrived. 
Um, no, the, I feel more sorry for you. Yeah. Problems. My problems yeah. with what I'm doing. Absolutely. <laughs> so you know how many phone calls they're going to start getting from yeah. some some strange characters. So um, the uh, the far enemy of appreciative joy is jealousy or envy, which is you know that's kind of a not a very good feeling. And it also can set into motion, a, a, you know, some fairly destructive behaviors. Like, uh, just take, for example, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, uh, needing to get that new car. Um, I had a, uh, a, a brother-in-law, um, great guy. Uh, he passed away some years ago. But his thing was, every year, he would buy a new Olds Cutlass Supreme. That's when they made those things. Mm. And so every model year, as soon as the new one came out, he would trade in his old one, take this huge hit on the, you know, whatever the trade-in value on this car was, and he'd buy a new Olds Cutlass. That was just his thing. But he had this, he had this kind of conviction that that was making a statement about him as a provider and as a smart person and, you know, as kind of a desirable sort of, you know, whatever, male of the species, I don't know. So it, just little observations like that, jealousy and envy can kind of put into, well, they can obviously, you know, trigger even violence and things like that. But the near enemy can be comparison or insincerity. So it's sort of like, you know, yeah, hey, that's great. I'm glad you got that raise. And then you're sort of thinking, boy, you know, I, I'm actually, I've got a better degree than that person. Maybe I should you know, make more money, or maybe, you know, I'm not sure, maybe I deserve better, and so you start to compare, and, and again, so that just sort of gets you away from the real appreciative joy, that comparison or insincerity keeps that circle of joy real tight, so it limits what you have access to. And then um, Upeka, the last one, that's equanimity. Um, just to explain equanimity in a little more detail, equanimity in the dictionary, it means a person who is who remains balanced and, and, and poised and composed even when things are really hectic and really difficult. So they're able to just kind of stay balanced and they're, they're able to stay good with it. Um, that is also true in the practice, but then we also add to that that it is a person who is not significantly attached. So we know that attachment is one of the things that causes us to suffer. And so uh, when there is uh, equanimity in our lives and in our practice, um, we know, there's, a, there's some wisdom there, that all the craving, all the wanting, leads to a feeling of imbalance rather than balance. And so the far enemy of equanimity is actually anxiety or dis-ease. And then we, we get to the near enemy, which is indifference, where you can just kind of say, I don't care, whatever. And usually you do care, but it's like, I don't care, whatever. You know, you kind of throw your hands up, you're done with it. But that indifference, you can feel like, okay, so I'm no longer obsessed about this thing, but you're really not freeing yourself up. So, with all of these, I guess I want to stress that these aren't like a moral test, um, but really, yeah, it's the, you know, sit with that. See what's true with for you. Um, see what of this makes sense. And then maybe notice those near enemies coming in because they do kind of hold us up from time to time. And what do they hold us up from? They just hold us up from being really free, you know. That, that you can feel so much better than maybe you do right now um, if you become aware of some of these things and, and start to move toward the full, real thing, the compassion, the loving kindness, the appreciative joy, and the equanimity. Let's see how we're doing on time. Um, and I think I've covered this pretty well uh, up to here. So what I've got in here is, uh, is a practice, um, kind of the long form of the four Brahma Viharas as a practice. And some of you are probably familiar with this. I share this stuff 
um, as often as I can. And again, I thought this was just pretty appropriate for the beginning of a new year. Um, so uh, we'll do this because the timing is about right at the end of our class here. Um, but one note I wanted to make is, you know, as we go through the reciting of the four Brahma Viharas, remember that you can't, in some situations, you can fake it till you make it, they say. In this one, uh, don't try to do that. <laughs> be aware of your limitation and then be okay with that, you know, because maybe there's somebody that you just, you're really not ready to offer complete compassion to or complete loving kindness to. And so if you pretend that you are, or you're trying to force yourself to do it, then it's not a natural thing. And, and so again, you're not really accomplishing anything. So I think what the real benefit is, is that if there's someone for whom maybe your heart is still a little hard, and you're really not able to offer them loving kindness or compassion, that you're aware of that, that you're aware that there's kind of this, this blockage or this you know, coagulation within you, and that you start to work with that in whatever way you can. So sometimes there's a middle ground where maybe you can't say, oh, I really hope this person is surrounded by love and kindness and compassion, but maybe you can start to honestly say, um, I no longer feel intense hatred for the person. You might not be able to say I feel love for him, but you might be able to say I can feel non-hate. You know, And you might be able to swing that. And so that if that's what you can do genuinely, that's great. I mean, that's, that's a real thing. So it's just seeing this. And, and, and so not setting it up as just something that you, you kind of recite and say, yep, that's, I'm, I'm doing it all. But to really notice, yeah, there's some people I'm just not ready, you know, I'm not ready. But maybe I'm ready to just offer a little compassion. Or maybe I'm, I'm ready to offer just a little bit of wisdom to understand that maybe some of the stuff that happened in their life led them to this place, you know, where they're, where they're causing me to suffer. And so maybe that's as far as I get with it. I can't forgive or I'm not ready, but just, you know, working with it in that way you're starting to develop this wisdom, so it can be very helpful. So with that, um, I'm just going to uh, close this out with this longer version of it. So what we're going to do is offer it to ourselves first. And I'll, I'll say the words, and just to the extent that you feel comfortable letting me speak for you, then you can just open up and absorb this. So we'll begin with to myself. And as we do this, really try to feel it. You know, try to feel it as a physical thing that you're really, that you're really getting into your chest, into your heart, into your mind, and that you're, you're feeling this as much as you can, so it's as real as possible. So to myself, may I be well. May I be safe. May I be free from suffering. May I be free from the causes of suffering. May I be loved and cared for. May I be the recipient of love and kindness. May I be surrounded by love and kindness. May I be happy. May I be blissful. May I be joyful. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be free. May I be equanimous. And so we're really offering this to ourselves that, yep, I've made mistakes in my life, I've been a jerk, I've done different things, but you know what? I still deserve to be well and to be happy and to be free. So we offer that to ourselves and that feels good. And then this can help us as we look at the next person that we're gonna offer this to. So now we think of somebody we love very much. So this is pretty easy. This is still in our circle, our pretty close circle. If you think of a partner or a child or a parent or family member or a very good friend, somebody you love very much, now we're gonna offer it to them. So you just see this person as if they're sitting right in front of you. You really see them vividly. May you be well. May you be safe. May you be free from suffering. May you be free from the causes of suffering. May you be loved and cared for. May you be the recipient of love and kindness. 
May you be surrounded by love and kindness. May you be happy. May you be blissful. May you be joyful. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be free. May you be equanimous. So you can really feel this pouring out of your heart directed at this other person. And now, the practice takes us to somebody who's maybe a little further outside of our circle, a neutral person. So somebody you're aware of, but you really don't have any strong feelings for them one way or another, no, you know, no strong negative, no strong positive, just someone you're aware of, a neutral person, or you can even kind of imagine someone who might fit that. And so to that neutral person, it's like, wow, we've got this wonderful gift. I just gave it to myself. I just gave it to this person I love very much. And here comes this neutral person. Now they're sitting in front of me. And so I say to them, may you be well. May you be safe. May you be free from suffering. May you be free from the causes of suffering. May you be loved and cared for. May you be the recipient of love and kindness. May you be surrounded by love and kindness. May you be happy. May you be blissful. May you be joyful. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be free. May you be equanimous. And so now you're feeling yourself giving this beautiful gift to this neutral person that you don't really know or have a strong feeling for. And this is just, this is wonderful. This is transformative. Offering what you can to this neutral person. And there's two steps left in this, but I'm just going to do one in the interest of time. And this is the one where we work with our difficult person. And everybody has somebody in mind who is really a challenge for them, you know. It doesn't mean it's an enemy or a person you hate, but sometimes it can be somebody you love, but is just a person who knows how to push all your buttons and frustrate you and make you crazy. Or it could be somebody that really did you damage at some point in time, emotionally. So to the extent that you can, and no more, just to the extent whatever you're able to offer to this difficult person, may you be well, may you be safe, may you be free from suffering, may you be free from the causes of suffering. May you be loved and cared for. May you be the recipient of love and kindness. May you be surrounded by love and kindness. May you be happy. May you be blissful. May you be joyful. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be free. May you be equanimous. And then I'll just close by saying to all of you, uh, sharing this space tonight, Thank you so much for being here. Happy New Year, a blessed 2018 to you, and may all of you be truly, truly happy. vision is just about completely gone, but she's, uh, she feels safe. And I told her I'll take care of her forever. It's dad's job. My son sent me a, uh, a photo he took uh, on a bulletin board. He works at a co-op. And somebody had posted a bulletin board. Um, they had a Frenchy, French bulldog that they needed to find a home for. Because they had had this Frenchie for some time uh, as a family pet. They had a baby, and the Frenchie did not like the baby. Actually, bit the baby. So, yeah, so they, they knew, okay, we have to find a different home. But, I mean, you know, I mean, it's not, you know, you don't have a dog like that put down or anything. It just didn't like the baby. So... 
I get it. Um, but uh, so he sent me that, and I, I kind of thought about it for a minute. Do I do I want to go get? His name was Frank, the the, the Frenchie. But uh, I thought, no, Lucy can't see. That'd be kind of stressful for her. So it's just her and I. Hey, good night, uh, good night Don. Night. Blessings. Take care. Good night. Good night, Don. So, sorry, I went a little long, good night, folks. Don. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I went a little long with this, but. Uh,